before the airplane, there was The Big Bus. A comedy disaster movie about a luxurious nuclear powered bus with a built in swimming pool and bowling alley that travels across the country as it's targeted by a cartoony supervillain. Welcome everyone to the Collector's Cut. I am Peter and I'm joined as always by David. Where is your god now, old woman? <laughs> That's the one you went with, is it? All right. That's my favorite line in the whole movie. The, the, there is a, there's, a, the, there's a lot of lines in this one. Because it's more of a comedy, there's a lot of zingers. That, I'm not just saying mm. they're all good. I'm just saying that there's a lot of lines that you could have taken. Oh, yeah. No, I had a running list, but that was the one that caught me off guard enough to use it. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, but yes, this is uh, The Collector's Cut. This is a movie podcast. We worked through seasons of movies, and this season is 70s disaster movies. This is movie number three of five. It is The Big Bus, a movie which I had never heard of until I was researching 70s disaster movies. Same here. So we're going to get into it. This one's more of a comedy. In fact, it's outright a spoof. Uh, to the yeah. point where I was thinking this was only made because of Airplane, but then David reminded me Airplane didn't come out until 1980. So this actually predates Airplane, despite feeling like it's ripping off Airplane. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's impressive. So uh, I think that's a compliment in the long run, I think. Uh, I suppose so. I suppose so. Uh, the, the premise of this is that there is a nuclear-powered bus, mm-hmm. the titular big bus, and... Right. Uh, it is driving non-stop from New York to Denver, which I thought was a... I, I guess that was meant to be funny in and of itself, that that's the, the journey it's making. It's not It's not coast to coast, it's not New York to LA, like, the, you know, the big location is, like, New York to Denver. I think the, the only reason I could come up with it is that Denver is in the Rocky Mountains, and okay. I think that they wanted to end this movie in the mountains, for reasons we'll get to. Oh, sure, okay, okay, I can maybe see that, yeah, okay. Mm. Uh... They, they, could have, they could have diverted. <laughs> it's just, you know, the, the idea that that's their, their destination. But, you know, it's the maiden voyage of the big bus. Mm-hmm. But there's sabotage. There is a evil mastermind referred to as Iron Man <laughs> who, wants to, who, yeah. wants, who wants to sabotage it. Because he's in, he's in the coal and oil industry and he doesn't like this nuclear energy business. So he wants mm-hmm. to sabotage it. I'm not even sure he's in the coal and oil industry he's just really good at sabotaging things and people like hire him out because they explicitly said that the he his like grandfather or something that was responsible for sinking the titanic uh oh yeah i remember that line i remember that line. yeah uh so yeah we'll, we'll we'll get into it we'll talk about the characters we'll talk about some of the jokes if i can remember because there was so many of them because it's a spoof that oh yeah uh, it's like it's impossible. constant it's Honestly, it's just a thing of remembering which ones are your favorites, because yeah. there are just more than you could list off. So, we'll get into all of that. We'll start spoiler-free, of course, as we always do. Uh, so, obviously, we'll keep all jokes that we might you know, regurgitate mm-hmm. until spoilers, but... Um, <laughs> this is only 90 minutes long. It's a comedy. So, you know, I, I am concerned that there might not be... A lot of meat in the bone here for conversation's <laughs> sake, especially since we had so much to talk about with Cassandra Crossing last time. But we'll see. I'm, how it goes. I'm sorry. Are you are you telling me you didn't pick up on the entire subplot of the American auto industry and versus the <laughs> versus the people? This was clearly an auteur's vision. <laughs> oh, I sure. Yes, the leading man, the bus driver, Dan who is mm-hmm. played by an actor who I recognize, believe it or not. I recognize really? him from two things specifically, but one prominently because I watched it earlier this year, and he is the star of Alligator 2, The Mutation, which I know none yeah. of you have seen, because why would you have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he also played uh, when... So when... Uh, what's, what's Joey's real name? Matt LeBlanc. When Matt LeBlanc mm. was on a, a guest role in Married with Children, this guy played his dad. <laughs> That is so niche. But the, the reason why it's memorable is because they tried to do a spin-off with them. Okay. Right? There, there was like yeah, five, that's also niche. There was like five backdoor pilots in Married with Children, and this was one of them. It was, it was going to be him and his dad as this comedy duo. And it never would obviously get picked up. It you know, died in its arse. But 
As do most Matt LeBlanc projects. <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. Uh, so that's uh, Joseph Bologna or Bologna or whatever he says. I think it's Bologna. Bologna? Just Bologna? That's how, that's how Americans spell Bologna, at least. We don't spell Bologna at all. Bologna, Bologna is not a word that we use. I, I like... Look, I don't want to get back into the Oscar Mayer debates here, <laughs> but I know how to spell baloney specifically from their commercials. So Sh sure. that's baloney. Baloney is not a word that's used here. Not that, I'm, not that I'm saying it's an American word. I'm pretty sure baloney comes from, uh, like, maybe Italy. <laughs> sounds, sounds oh, probably, I don't yeah. know. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't call sliced meat baloney. That's not a thing here. Fair enough. It's just sliced meat. <laughs> I mean, not all sliced meat is bologna, but bologna is sliced meat. Oh. Wait, is it just a brand, or is it a specific type of sliced meat? You are getting too deep into this, and I don't have questions for, or answers for all <laughs> your questions here. This is... Because I wouldn't say there's, like, a famous brand here that, like, everyone reckon... Uh, that's, like, one of those... It's always just the supermarket's own, if, yeah. if you make sense. Definitely. I mean, I'll, I'll do a quick Google search here. Uh, bologna is a city in germany which that's not helpful and oh, maybe it's then, a german word it just it sounds it looks more italian to me but uh. all right bologna sausage is a sausage derived from a specific italian pork so that's so, italian i was right yes yeah that's there you go genius in north america a simple and popular use is the bologna sandwich there you go there you go are we talking about a movie? I forget. <laughs> yes. Well, this is Joseph Bologna. This is, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is where it led. Uh, we yeah. got him. I also recognize the priest character because he's Odo in Deep Space Nine. Uh, okay. So you got him. Uh, and then Ned Beatty has got a small role in this. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people know him from Superman, uh, yep. you know, one and two. Uh, or you might know him from Deliverance. Right. Yeah, those are the uh, big movies. The one that jumped out to me was the female lead of Stockard Channing, who has been in several things, but the one that jumped out to me the most is she was Rizzo in Greece. Ah, uh, okay, okay. I, I did see so, that when I was a kid, but like I don't really yeah. remember much of it. But nah, that's fair. Uh yeah, yeah. Okay. That's it. Uh, so it's not quite the all-star cast that some of these other disaster movies had, which no. tells you that we're operating on a different wavelength to these other big movies. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense, given that it is more of a, a comedy that's making fun of them. I mean, the, the movie starts with text and narration that yeah. says, you saw the movie where the big boat sank. You saw the movie where the building was on fire. You saw the movie where the earthquake hit. Now you're going to see the big bus. That is how the movie starts. So, and it, I mean, immediately, you know that it's not taking itself seriously. Well, like I mean, obviously it was going to be a comedy. The moment mm -hmm. where I realized, oh, no, we're doing this, we're in a spoof, was mm -hmm. there's a joke early on, which I won't say what it is, but there's a joke early on with how they handle radioactive material. And I went, oh, OK, we're yeah. in a, we're, it was a spoof. OK, all right. For, right we're just in the spoof territory. Yeah. Uh logic and reason has has no bearing on anything that's going to happen in this <laughs> and we just we can just roll with it. Uh so. I I will say uh comparing it to airplane it doesn't feel as densely packed with jokes. Sure. Like airplane is just every time they speak it's some gag or some visual thing. But this movie definitely feels a bit more spaced out where they are they're always funny. They're always doing something somewhat comedy slanted but the actual punchlines don't hit nearly as quickly sure so um, yeah uh but yeah i mean that, that's the the gist of it uh you know they, mm -hmm. they have to get the, this new bus driver in last minute who's got a history with the female lead kitty kitty is the designer of the bus her father runs the company that's built the damn thing mm -hmm. and uh she's not happy about bringing them in but they bring them in and obviously there's some backstory with them that we'll get to and, and whatever else. But uh, yep. that is the gist of it. They're driving from New York to Denver. There's sabotage. And this weird luxury nuclear-powered bus, which obviously is much bigger on the inside than it has any right to be. But that's just you know part oh, yeah. of the joke. So I mean, this this thing, you say much bigger on the inside. But even then, it is a massive bus. This oh, thing it's is huge. Double decker tall and twice the length of a normal bus. So yes, uh, and the front has got this like sort of dual window front where you can sort of see the the, the up and the 
they'll do the top mm-hmm. and the bottom of the front uh and they kind of treat it like they treat it like it's a spaceship where mm. like they've got buttons for it to do things that no bus would ever like <laughs> have like oh, yeah. jettison the something something they'll press a button and some you know drop door will open and things will fall out and it's like yeah, yeah okay yeah because it- this is how a bus does things. Uh, and they've even got, like, a mission control who are, like, keeping track of them and helping oh, yeah. and stuff. So It's a full-on NASA setup. Yes. So that that is where this film is. You've got an idea of it. David, did yes. you enjoy the big bus? So we have not really tackled straight comedies on this show yet. The closest we got were the Santa Claus movies. Mm -hmm. This single movie made me laugh more than all the Santa Claus movies combined. (laughs) I genuinely enjoyed this one. This one was just a good time for me overall. In terms of disaster movie, I mean, it follows this beats of, you know, things keep on getting worse and worse and they keep on having to overcome. And obviously it doesn't get too bogged down in like, the misery of it where it's like oh god we've lost someone else because it's a comedy they're yeah, just tongue and cheek yeah yeah absolutely but i don't know i think that it's it's comedy spoof first and disaster movie second but it does still follow at least the beats of a disaster movie so, so. they're more cartoony but i would say that the ensemble cast feels like a disaster movie cast oh absolutely if we even just compare it to uh Cassandra Crossing from last one, we had the married couple in this movie who were within the span of the movie on again, off again, like five times. <laughs> like they know exactly what they're spoofing and they do it very well. So uh, yeah, I definitely liked it. Yeah. That's actually came out the same year as Cassandra Crossing, 1976. Mm-hmm. Uh, funnily enough. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually know how I feel about it almost. Like, I feel like for every joke I liked, there was a lot that made me groan. Or, a, no, not even groan, just a, a lot that just landed with a thud. Like, you know, I didn't really feel okay. anything about them. Uh, there were moments, though, and there were lines that did make me chuckle. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, s- simple reactions to things or, uh, you know, the radioactive joke that I sort of referenced earlier at the start of the movie did actually make me laugh just because it was so uh, ridiculous. Um, mm-hmm. At one point in the music from 2001 plays, I won't say yeah. which point, but I did also appreciate that. You know, th- there's things like that that I did get into. Um, I wouldn't say that every bit of character comedy necessarily worked for me, though. Um, you know, just, you know, the entire backstory of the main character, which, which we'll get into, like, every time they started bringing that up, I'm like, this isn't that funny. I don't, I don't <laughs> this, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can see yeah. that. Yeah. But at the same time, though, this idea that all the bus drivers we see in the movie early on are, like, really, like, passionate about being bus drivers, and there's lines like, uh, I'm a bus driver, and a bus driver's got to drive, and, like, <laughs> or, you know, just, like, they, they, they act like they're all, like... I, I guess the closest thing would be, like, in a movie where it's, like, a, a tight group of cops who all really care about being cops. So they, they talk mm-hmm. about, like, the, 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 the drama of the, the job and the duty of it. Well, this is how these bus drivers talk about being bus drivers. Yeah. Um, so To the point where there's a bus driver bar at the start, start of the movie. So you know, that amuses me. I, yeah. I, I would say that I was more amused than I laughed for the most part. But there, there was That's the odd fair. thing that made me laugh. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can fully understand that. It's definitely... Definitely not... I guess when I say it got more laughs out of me, I'm not talking about full belly laughs or mm. anything like that. I'm talking about the kind of laugh that you give when you type LOL into a text. It's just that mm. exhalation of breath. That's like, yeah, no, this was this was amusing. This was, I considered to be successful comedy in the fact that if I am having to say that, you know, a real laugh is something that I audibly stop and like have to gasp for breath for it, there's maybe only like four movies that have ever done that. <laughs> yeah, I it, it does make it harder to talk about though because I feel like comedies by their nature are have you know like you're just kind of regurgitating jokes at a certain point rather oh, than yeah. you know breaking Absolutely. things down and analyzing or whatever. You, like, how do you analyze this beyond just maybe what are the disaster movie tropes that it's kind of playing with and making fun of? Yeah. And yeah, obviously some of that's in there. Like, I would say that. 
plot wise obviously we compare it to airplane for obvious reasons but i would say the threat of the bomb on the bus and kind of the like the fallout of it it does actually mirror out of the ones i've seen most closely it mirrors air, uh, airport which is what airplanes directly right. spoofing because that's mm-hmm. what the threat is in that it's a bomb on the the, the plane so this is yeah. just doing that on a bus but obviously with the the hijinks and the comedy um and doing things like you know the the cap like he's a captain he's not just the bus driver he's the captain and he has a captain's table that he invites people to dinner right to you know wacky things like that so like it, it's making fun of these tropes and you know that was something that was in poseidon adventure that, that we did is you know the captains mm-hmm. invited people and that was and funnily enough who was the captain in poseidon adventure it was the the man who we associate with spoofs more than any other actor it's it's all just a circle everything feeds back into itself yeah that's actually i didn't even think of that but yeah leslie nielsen mm-hmm. is the spoof guy he did all the naked guns he did airplane and mm-hmm. here we are we have this movie that predates his spoofs kind of referencing his prior role in another disaster movie that's kind of funny yep i mean you said at the beginning that this did specifically say you've seen the big boats you've seen the mm-hmm. big buildings on fire i mean i think we could point out specifically that's probably talking about poseidon adventure is it not oh absolutely that that's referencing poseidon adventure tower and inferno earthquake and i think it was the fourth one it mentioned which i don't remember off the top of my head but <laughs> fair enough but yeah it like it's, it's directly referencing these big films from 70 mm-hmm. 72 74 I mean, the airport may have been the other one actually i just can't remember what it said for it but uh that would make sense because that was the other yeah. big one but yeah because they were all because i think oh no no it was uh big german balloons oh that was the yeah last so it's probably like a, a hindenburg a... style mm-hmm. movie which i don't know what that is to be honest off of my head but yeah, same. fair enough uh, yeah it's um but it's referencing the biggest ones plus the balloon one <laughs> um <laughs> so it's uh, you know it, it definitely is setting you up to be thinking about those as you're watching the movie so when you start seeing i mean i would say that the first like 20 minutes is definitely the part that's the least disaster movie like because it's it very much plays like already oh, to find this you know the guy to drive our bus it plays it's, it's like a normal movie with just a mm. couple of main characters and then when we get to oh the bus is going to launch soon then we start getting all the the ensemble introduced at the right. the bus station and it's like okay that this feels like the start of a disaster movie you know comedy version yeah. but this is you know i mean that's that honestly i feel like that's where it differs the most from like airplane for example is that we probably go a good half an hour into this 90 minute movie before we actually get introduced to what i think would be any other disaster movies like first thing of showing off here's everyone you're going to be associated with meanwhile airplane uh, as i brought up does it really even do the ensemble I don't feel like it really does. No, it that doesn't actually. As, uh, yeah. I, I guess well, because I think airplane, as much as it's spoofing airport, I don't think, I don't think it has like this mantra where it's trying to like be a the definitive disaster movie spoof. It's just trying to use airport mm. as a skeleton to, to tell all these jokes. Right. Whereas this is directly saying, no, no, we are doing a disaster movie spoof. Right, and I did look up. Uh, there was a 1975 disaster film of The Hindenburg, starring George C. Scott. I don't think I had that much. Maybe season two of seventies disaster movies will have to be six movies to to fit that right. bad boy in. But uh, there you go. Um, yeah, interesting. Interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's definitely a wackier time. Like, it's, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do think it's easily the weakest of the three that we've done. I mean, uh, the, the, I, you you can say that, uh, but okay. when we get down to ratings, I don't know. Uh, okay, I, maybe you like this I, one more. Because uh, yeah. I like Cassandra Crossing more than you, so I mean, maybe. Yeah, no, that's fair. It might just be different tastes at this point. But this one, this one at least, as I said in Cassandra Crossing, it had trouble keeping me engaged. It had trouble keeping me interested the whole way through. Uh, this one, I was engaged the whole time. I was keep an eye because it was just fun it was a fun movie it was set out to do exactly what it was trying to do it kept me amused and i think it did a pretty good job of taking all these different tropes from disaster movies and turning it into a coherent plot something that made sense in a film way even outside of just comedy 
in a cartoony sense, sure. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. Because, <laughs> you know, I think if you really scrutinize some of it, it's not going to hold up very well. I mean, what's wrong with a nuclear-powered bus? I don't see any yeah. issues with that. Yeah, uh, well, one, yeah. Of the, one of the things they introduced with that, actually, is that they do the whole, you know, when you're on a plane and the, they'll do the, like, this is how you use your, right. your safety vest thing. But in this movie, in case of a radiation leak, uh, your hazmat suit will drop down, and here's the hundred <laughs> little instructions you need to know about setting this thing up. <laughs> I know you said not to go into the jokes, but just yeah. the second part to that, of like, how do we know if we did it right? And she's like, good question. If you haven't done it right, you'll experience blindness and hair loss, <laughs> and the taste of blood in your mouth. It's like, oh, all right. <laughs> it's Chernobyl on a bus. Yep, pretty much. Potentially. Though, oddly enough, the nuclear aspect of it doesn't really play in no, it's, at all. If anything, it's just the motive for why the bad guys uh, are yeah. to try to take it out. It doesn't actually play... Because I was expecting I was expecting, oh, there's a like nuclear like radiation leak or something or, yeah. or whatever. But no, it's just... It's just no, 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 no. Like, uh, the bomb uh, messes up the bus enough that they can't stop. So it becomes this mm -hmm. kind of, we have to keep driving... Uh, in a, in a weird way, it almost goes into speed territory, except it never takes itself seriously, so I don't think for a second that right. it in any way inspires speed. It's just that... No, definitely not. No, it, it just, you know, it's, it just, it's almost in that territory that we can't slow down. But it's more like the brakes don't work, rather than, yeah, you know, anything the, else. The bomb is set to a timer. It doesn't matter what they do. Yes. The bomb would go off. So. And it just so happened to disable the brakes, yeah. which, of course, leads to its own hijinks the whole way through. And so, we obviously, we mentioned the main character. We mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the, sort of the love interest and the, the mm -hmm. bus designer, Kitty. Um, we have a co-captain or a co-driver <laughs> uh, named Shoulders, uh, who, I won't say what it is, but he's got like a sort of jokey gimmick. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically his whole thing, to be honest. Um yeah. Uh, Odo from Deep Space Nine plays a priest who's kind of like given up religion and is really cynical <laughs> about it. Anytime anyone asks him about it, that's his character. Ned Beatty's the guy back at Mission Control. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a guy who only has six months left to live, and that's yep. kind of his running thing. Is he, that keeps coming up in different ways. We have uh, a woman who is like a fashion designer and is very eccentric. I would say the woman fashion designer character, not to get too spoilery with it, but she's the most overstuffed character mm. of the plot, where it seems like she has three or four different things going on that don't relate to each other. Sure. They yeah. all just happen to be her things. Yeah. And uh, we mentioned the married couple that are in the process of getting divorced and are mm. constantly bickering in kind of a playful way. And uh, you know, that stuff sort of comes in and out of it as the movie goes on as well. Yep. Uh, so that's pretty much all of her characters right uh, outside of that you have the assistant to the guy back in mission control who's just constantly crapped on the entire time uh you have the veterinarian who is disgraced oh, of course of course yes, yes yes and you have the old lady who i'm not entirely sure what her gimmick was but she was there her i think her gimmick just changed so that she's the old lady with a punchline in various scenes depending what yeah. the context of the scene was uh, yeah, that's fair. If you want her to be horny in this scene, she'll be horny. If you want her to be <laughs> scared in this scene, she'll be scared. You know, it was just kind of whatever the scene called for. Yep. And then in terms of villains, you said that we have Iron Man, who, rather than an iron suit, is instead <laughs> in an iron lung. And his bumbling brother slash sidekick, who is the one actually trying to do the things to take out the bus. Yes. Uh, and a nuclear powered bus is not the only piece of technology that's just fantastical that's in this movie. We'll get to that uh, and yeah. spoilers. So, yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a whole lot that I think I can add without getting into the, the spoilers. Yeah, no, because, it, it is the uh, issue of a comedy in that all we can really talk about is the tropes and the jokes. And both those are pretty spoilery all around, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will say here, uh, Joseph Baloney does, um, he fits this role better than his role in Alligator 2, where he's like the leading cop character who's going to, like, you know, hunt down the alligator. Like, he always feels like he's, he belongs on a sitcom, 
in that movie mm -hmm. when that's not what the movie really is supposed to be. Here it works better because it's a comedy, so at least it's like okay, his his uh his delivery and tone fit what was going on around him at the oh, very yeah. least. So no, he was he was exactly what this role needed. I, I again to keep going back to Airplane, but he did feel exactly like the leading role in that movie as well. Mm -hmm. Just that same sort of put upon the world his chewed him up, spit him out, but he's still funny the whole way through. All right, so we'll give the spoiler warning then. So full spoilers for the big bus from this point on. You have been warned. Uh, yeah, so Dan's backstory, our main character's backstory, is that all the bus drivers don't like him. He goes into the bar at the start, and the bus drivers all just shun him, and they all start clicking and, like... Clicking their hole punchers. Yeah. Like West Side Story. <laughs> and they don't like his kind. They want him gone. And we find out uh, in this scene that his bus like a couple of years ago whatever it was mm -hmm. uh got lost in the mountains and everyone all the passengers died and they all believe that he survived by eating all of the passengers to which he responds no the so it's not just the, the, the nuclear bus that has a co-driver apparently this bus also yeah. had a co-driver he they says have co-drivers <laughs> have you ever been on a bus that's had a second driver <laughs> i've never taken a cross-country trip to mount diablo I'm sure that would have a co-driver. Oh, maybe, maybe. Uh, but whatever. Um, so <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. I ate the seats. I ate the cushions. I ate all these other things. I did technically eat one foot because the co-driver made a shoe from the foot. <laughs> so I, ha I had one foot. And it's important to note the co-driver is the person who ate 110 people yes. on this bus. <laughs> <laughs> Which... I mean, he must have, like, noticed the cannibalism by this point. By the time this shoe, unless it was the first thing that he made, like, before he'd yeah. eaten any other bodies, like, this was the first thing he did. I mean, I wouldn't know that. But I do, they did specifically point out the, like, it's like, well, you could have stopped him. He's like, I tried. He was a crazed animal. He wouldn't stop. He just kept eating them. Also, I'm pretty sure they were only lost in the mountains for, like, two days. <laughs> yes. I think they said. So... <laughs> Yeah, for, take take away the fact that you have to get really desperate to consider cannibalism. Apparently not for this guy, but nope. also the he fact that he went through a hundred people to eat mm -hmm. in forty eight hours. That doesn't feel like he's feasting a bit much there. I don't know. That's, 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 that's... <laughs> but again, it's played up with the comedy. It works, of course, of course. Although so, I will agree with you, uh, I do think that's the one joke that is overplayed to the point where it kind of loses its humor a little bit. Yeah, it comes up multiple times that, you know, he ate a foot. This guy ate a foot. He's a cannibal. He ate a foot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I just wasn't that into it every time it came up. I mean, this bar scene I thought was mostly amusing because of the way they were this playing with the This bar scene was jokes. fantastic. That bar scene's what sold me to stay invested throughout the entire movie. <laughs> There's a, obviously, it breaks out into a bar fight, and that's how he meets Shoulders, uh, because yes. Shoulders comes to his aid during the bar fight. And there's one joke in particular where Shoulders picks up a carton of milk smashes it on the uh counter and guy's like look out he's got a broken carton of milk which which you know just so in, in everyone's heads here imagine any yeah. other bar fight scene where someone grabs a bottle and smashes it so it's sharp exactly. you've got a stabbing weapon he's he's halves a carton of milk so he's got a bit of soggy paper or cardboard exactly. in his hand that's all and he's got so, and then some other guy grabs a candle does the same thing he's like look out he's got a broken candle it's just, and they're just like dancing around each other, just like poking each other with it. And it's just like, this is so stupid, but I love every second of it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the joke that kind the, the one I mentioned, the radioactive one that kind of mm -hmm. like, okay, I kind of appreciate the absurdity of this, where you've got the, like, the, uh, the main woman's like father is like, okay, we're, we're getting like the, the atomic rod ready to power the mm -hmm. bus. And they're, they're in like a lab, and he's got the goggles on, and the, it's behind a glass screen, and they've got a robotic arm picking up this glowing rod that they're going to put in this chamber, and it sort of like tilts, and it won't go in, mm -hmm. and the scientist man's like, "Damn it, I was afraid of this. Oh, you were afraid that it was going to lose grip, and <laughs> just not yeah. quite going." And he's like, "Hey, Ned Beatty, want to deal with this?" And Ned Beatty removes his goggles. <laughs> to go into the room with the atomic rod and just pulls out a handkerchief and just uses the handkerchief to sort of adjust it with his hand. <laughs> and then he walks back out and he's like, you did it, Ned. And he puts out his hand for a handshake and then someone else goes, no, 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 <laughs> don't shake his hand. 
<laughs> I was like, okay, that was that, that, yeah. That, 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 that was that was a little bit funny. I, I, that, like you know, I'll, I'll, to get, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it points there. It, it was yeah. it was amusing. Um, uh, and then obviously the bomb goes off at the, the laboratory. Lab. Yeah, someone try, it, they try to sabotage early before the bus even leaves, but the bus is fine. Yep. And the running thing that, again, I think was overplayed in the beginning mm -hmm. is that the professor, Kitty's dad, is impaled by a St. Christopher's medal. And the doctor on site basically says that he can't be moved, not even to bring him to a hospital or else he's risking death. So they just keep him out on this parking lot ground for the entirety of the movie. And everyone has to keep on referencing back to him as he's just laying there. Yeah, I it, think that that one got overplayed a little bit. Yeah, well. it's one thing to get one quick scene of him in the storm when he's like trying to lie there in a the sleeping bag, uh, mm. without being moved. But it cuts back to them in the storm like three times, and it's like, yeah, yeah I, I get it. You know, you've, you've done this joke. I mean, I think that they ended it at the proper time, which is they had the professor brought into the lab, and then it's revealed that they literally carved up the piece of the parking lot and brought it in on a forklift. Mm -hmm. I think. In terms of escalating the joke, that's pretty much as high as you can go. Yeah, yeah. So. So, either that or when the bus comes out, he's in the way, but the bus has to go through him. So it's like, sorry. <laughs> like, you either yeah. end it with a joke death or you, yeah, you do something silly like that. Yeah. Um. So, but they need, they need so they've lost the driver though. So they, they need Dan and mm -hmm. it's uh, the professor who's like, we need Dan. I don't, oh, oh yeah, this is actually... I, honestly my favorite line of the whole movie might be in the first like five minutes okay. it's when he's lying there and he's got his, this chain sticking out of him right and it's like mm -hmm. near something important so you know we can't jostle it we can't you know do anything to it and he's like okay honey kitty you're gonna have to get dad he's like no dad i don't want to, i'm not going to speak to dad never and he's like look kitty you're gonna have to put your past with him behind you we're talking about buses here woman and he sort of like <laughs> clenches his fist and i just the the way that everyone talks about buses in this movie like it's this like like, like they're astronauts and they're like they're honored yeah to be bus drivers just like that that exactly running gag it did make me laugh it was do you know what it made me think of it made me think of like i'm watching parts and rec and the way the librarians mm. talk about being librarians or the firefighters and like uh brooklyn 99 talk about being firefighters it's that kind right. of joke it's that well this is a duty and a sense of honor and like we were put on this earth to be bus drivers right. um but yeah we're talking buses here women i don't know i just thought that was funny uh, yeah, but, yeah yeah so uh dan insists that shoulders be his his, his co-captain his co-driver uh, mm -hmm. Although he regrets it quite quickly when he finds out that Shoulders just goes into blackouts, uh, especially when he's moving. Yeah. Uh, or even talks about moving. They're yes. like, all right, Dan, time to get moving. <sighs> Which really, really, you know, stuck out to me later where there's a scene where he's, he's at his dining table entertaining some of the, you know, prestigious guests on the bus. I'm like, wait, that's means Shoulders is driving. That seems a mm -hmm. bit dangerous to me. Well, you didn't cover it. How did he get the name Shoulders? Because he always drives on the shoulder. Yep. And that's actually when he comes back. He's, he goes back to the back, and then all of a sudden the bus starts shaking, and we see the shoulders just been driving in the shoulder the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, there's a little bit of build-up. Uh, there's like a really big joke, actually, near the start, where, again, this idea of treating being a bus driver like really... You know, like I mean, a, I, like I a feel like it has to be astronaut. Like yeah. everything about this just screams that this is the parallel of astronaut. Yeah, but there's a scene where Dan goes to, to when he's like sort of mulling over like, if he's accepting the job or not because it's, you know, it's his big choice, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he he goes to his father's grave, who is also a bus driver, and starts asking him and talking to him. But the joke is, is that he keeps kind of getting like off track and interrupted because there's other people at gravestones near him also talking to their <laughs> deceased and then the camera eventually pulls back and you just hear this cacophony of noise as there's like dozens if not hundreds of people all talking to gravestones i that's one of my favorite jokes in movies of whenever somebody does something that's in a movie for one person to do makes sense it may be over the top but it makes sense but then to have a whole bunch of people do it, and everyone's got their own story going on. Hmm. 
That's one of my, because my uh, one I come back to is, I know you're not a fan of the movie, but Scott Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a scene where vegan cops come in and come after Brandon Routh. And it you watch in the background after they've done their thing, like they've got their whole other plot going on. Like there's a, they're their own characters in a story that is not being told to the audience. And I just love that joke the same way it is here, where there's a guy who's just like, he's been stealing money right out from under me the whole time, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know. That always gets me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's like a big speech he gives or something to the the the, the staff of the bus, like, like it's his, mm-hmm. like you know, like he's like he's a ship captain and he's talking to the crew. He's like, uh, like how many people are on this damn thing? <laughs> like this is. So we get the big reel of the bus though, and it's the two thousand one music, which I you know I know, right. I, I, like I can never. Thus remember. spoke Zarathustra. There you go. I can never remember the damn title of the song. Mm-hmm. But uh, that plays as the bus is being unveiled for the first time uh, out of the out of the, the garage or whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, this, I don't know if it's right before or after this, where we get all the other passengers introduced in the, the bus station and, uh, you know, we get all their, yeah. their various bits and pieces. Uh, the only real joke I remember here is the fashion designer lady deciding to have sex with one of the workers in the station. Yeah, I didn't get that one. It just seemed kind of out of nowhere, but hey, she's spon- I guess it... She's spontaneous. Well, that's, that's what yes, it. but also, <laughs> that's one of those things where it's one of her, like, four completely different character traits. Mm. Where she has all these... Apparently, she's seductive, but also, as we find out later in the movie, uh, she's vengeful. And then, even later on in the movie, like, she's just kind of goes all in on the fashionista part so none of those really gel with each other and it's the only character i feel like didn't quite work for me do you think she was maybe like two or three different characters in the original draft and they've just combined to i mean it's possible i think it's it's also maybe a thing of like maybe she was really good in whatever they originally wrote her for and they're like yeah we can give you like a few extra lines we can keep you around Mm -hmm. a bit more um, one joke you did skip over that I love was um, they're having a little celebration party thing, and the they're talking to the professor. And the professor's like, "I'm afraid that somebody's going to break in and sabotage the bus." And Dan's like, "Don't worry. When I locked up, I left the lights on so that people would still think that they're working in there. Nobody's going to come in." And then it immediately smash cuts to the guy who's going to sabotage. He'd be like, "Hello, is anyone working here?" All right. And just immediately, <laughs> like, perfectly well done there. Mm. So, you know, they get, they get on their, their, their trip. Uh, they have, like, a crowd waving them off as if they're mm-hmm. a ship leaving dock in the 1930s or whatever. Of course. Uh, and they go on their, their trip. And we're introduced to some of the bus's features. Um, mm. For example, it can jettison a tire at will and replace it with a spare. It's all automated. So they do like yep. a test, system test, and like system checks, and like okay, let's test that, and and it's like okay, uh, they've got like a, a car wash a feature where the, yeah, the, it's just it's a self cleaning feature, but it is literally a full car wash. Yeah, basically the 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 what do you even call it? The spinny things from a car wash come out and the the rolling pin <laughs> yeah. style <laughs> whatever. I don't know what you call them, but. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're, and it comes out of play a bit later when uh, Dan's like climbing on top of the bus and they, they, someone mm-hmm. turns it on by accident or the bus is like malfunction and it turns on by itself and he's like mm-hmm. sort of getting, you know, washed and cleaned as he's going up over the top of the bus. Right. Uh, so, yeah, we're introduced to these various features. We're also introduced that they're going to try and break this speed record, uh, kind of. So, the way I gathered it is that they're basically trying to go fast enough that they can get past wind resistance. Yes. Like a bus being so big and bulky, it has to do with a lot of wind resistance. But if you go fast enough, you can like slipstream it. That's what I picked up. Which they refer to as breaking wind. As one does. I see nothing wrong with that. I don't know. That that, that was a little <laughs> on the juvenile side for my uh, <laughs> my taste, I think. I mean, it was, but it, they repeated it like four times and then they just dropped it entirely, so mm. it wasn't that much. 
yeah and you know honestly at this point we're like halfway through the movie <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's, we're already like that's halfway what done. Me. i i had to i had to pause just to go to the bathroom at one point and i was amazed at how far in we were i think i paused like 70 minutes in and it did not feel like it at all yeah like you know you know i mentioned earlier there's the joke where the passengers have been told about their their suits that drop down and stuff if they mm-hmm. need them or or whatever and there's obviously little bits and pieces with the passengers around this part of the movie that's just sort of furthering their you know interest in the, the priest properly and his cynicism mm-hmm. or whatever but yeah it's just all little things and when you're actually trying to recount in the movie like you know at this point you're basically ready to all in the dinner scene where he gets mad because someone remembers that he's uh the foot guy <laughs> yeah. um it basically it's like okay there's a problem oh there's something you know going on here in this part of the bus so he climbs out to see what it is and no there's a bomb there and yeah. this this kind of like propels the the main problem which is why they, they end up not being able to stop in the town now i have a mm-hmm. question maybe maybe i missed the explanation of this yes. this uh foam like so so they're going to this town and like in the town they, they spray it with like foam all over the street to slow mm-hmm. them to help slow them down I was unclear if this was something they were doing just to help it stop in general, like this was always part of the plan, or if this was only because it was malfunctioning and they needed help to slow down. Okay, good question. Moving on. (laughs) I have no idea. I genuinely... uh, As long as I'm not crazy. Yeah. That's all I I need to know. Uh, Obviously it doesn't help. And eventually they end up in that they're on a windy road and they can't slow down, so he's like, Mm. you know and this is the this was the wind they wrote his father died on i think he said well i'm not even sure that it wasn't that they couldn't slow down at that point i feel like they spe- he specifically said like oh i'm gonna it's uh what was it it's like i don't know breakneck pass or something like that some crazy name but yes his father is the one who died in it and he specifically says like i'm not gonna let it stop me so he's taking all <laughs> these turns at like top speed just because why not yeah uh, and, and i do lo- i do love yeah. that's the other part of this movie is that they explicitly say that there are multiple times where like they probably could have stopped but he's so determined to make this a non-stop trip <laughs> from new york he's like these people paid for non-stop ticket and damn it they're gonna get it well that was that was the thing at the start of the movie say oh this will be the first ever bus that goes non-stop from new york to denver i'm like mm-hmm. Show those buses from New York to Denver. And I'll be like, wait, the non-stop part's the part you're... Pr- like, you could literally just do that with any bus. Just say, don't stop any... Like, you know... Okay, in fairness, it's a 26-hour trip, and I think the problem is gas. Oh, like, okay, stopping sure. stopping to get gas. Okay, so that's the one thing that's special about it, is that the nuclear power means you don't have to stop and get gas. That's it. Yes. That is the... the like, that's not that impressive. Like, how many <laughs> stop once or twice to refuel the tank? It's, it's not, not, not that big I mean, a deal. There's also the green stuff of it's not spitting out carbon and stuff like that. There's, you could claim that if you needed oh, to. Oh yeah, but the point I'm making is that he specifically is proud, like, the first ever bus trip non-stop from New York to Denver. He's literally proud of the fact that he comes from a long line of bus drivers. <laughs> Clearly you have your apples in the wrong basket here. Oh dear. It's, it's when I get on the windy road though, there's a random like family in a truck that end up crashing into the the top half of the front bit uh and this ends up with them teetering over a ledge which is the the real disaster part really is this this this, this, Mm. like 15 minute section where they're teetering over the edge and they do various things to try and tip their weight back into the back half of the bus one of Mm. which is to like and they've got buttons for this in the cockpit for some reason to jettison all of the uh you know the all the soda streams right so they're yeah. like all right jettison the the mountain dew and it starts spurting out so they're filling up this back compartment of the bus with uh you know soda soda yeah. uh which i, I we call it soda here so i, I keep saying I, I keep going to say juice but i'm like americans won't get it they'll, they'll think i'm talking no. about like orange juice yeah <laughs> we, we will accept soda soft drinks or pop but juice is off the table pop I'll call it pop I don't, but it is a regional dialect. I the, 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 what shitty regions are calling it pop? Like I, I think less of you. Anyone who calls it pop, I think less of you. <laughs> I didn't know we were drawing lines in the sand here today. All right. Um, I'll accept soft drinks. Soft drinks, mate. Um, right. so uh, but yeah, no the 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 soda room specifically. They that's where the second level of disaster comes in, and that they had to 
air lock the so, the kitchen where they're on the Why do they have airlocks on a bus? <laughs> because this is the most advanced bus known to man, Peter. Now, does it help? I mean, obviously, you see at one point they've got like a swimming pool room, and I'm like, where yep. does this all fit? They <laughs> like, have a where's... swimming pool and a single lane bowling alley. Yes, that's right. They have a bowling alley. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, our, our female lead, Kitty, has been knocked out in this mm. soda room. So she's actually like, it's filling up with soda, and she's going to drown in the soda. So, yep. because Dan has decided, that, you know, he he's sad that he ever let her go, and that she's the love of his life, uh, he's like, no, I'm going. And this is when he's climbing on top of the the bus, and he's getting hit with the the cleaning stuff, and yep. all all the other obstacles in his way, and he starts saying things out loud where he's like, you know what, I'm sorry, Kay, I'm sorry, I cheated on you with, and then starts listing every woman that he's cheated on her with <laughs> in the past, including her aunt. What's her name? Uh, to which, at which point she reveals that she's hearing all this over the comms because she's woken up mm-hmm. and she's like, "Damn you, Aunt Dolores, or whatever her name was." Yeah. Oh, that's another joke that I liked much earlier in the movie, um, where they discover that there is a bomb in there, and he calls up Shoulders and says, "Shoulders, I need you to hook me in with uh, Kitty. Get me on the comms with her." And Shoulders presses some buttons, accidentally puts him over the comms to the whole bus, and <laughs> yeah. says, "Kitty." I gotta let you know there's a bomb on this bus. <laughs> yeah, but make sure you don't tell anyone. Don't alarm anyone, and all the passengers yeah. are all screaming because they just, just hurt. freak out. Uh, yeah, so they have the heart to heart when he's coming to save her and mm. whatever. Uh, you know, again, there's a couple it, it, of amusing lines in here where I think again referencing that he was cheating on her is like, you know, I slept with all those other women so that I could think about you, and she says, "Why don't you just sleep with me to think about me?" He's like. Huh? That's a good, a good point. Uh, but now I just want to be with you and think about them. Oh god, I lost it at that part. That part was great. <laughs> it was a good play. It was a good play. Yeah. Uh, they've also got a button to jettison all the luggage at the front, which I feel like that's the first thing you'd have done. That, that that's obviously like a lot of weight in the front half of the bus that you could be. That opens them up to lawsuits. You don't want that. <laughs> uh so they they try and you know hook things onto a tree you know it gets all yeah. the women to take their underwear off why their underwear specifically and not just anyone wearing an extra shirt or like anything that's you know you can do without mm-hmm. first maybe no the women specifically take off your underwear well uh for some reason on a poseidon adventure the woman had to take off their dresses yet that's some of them true. didn't that's true uh, at least here it's got the excuse of being a comedy, so yeah, fair. I'll, you know I'll I'll give it that at the very <laughs> least. Uh, um, in fact, what, one of the things they do as well, actually, when they're they're going really fast around the bends and they want to slow down a little bit, is he says we we need something to break the wind, um, release the flags of every nation, and then all these flags pop up at the t- top of the bus, uh, which obviously aren't helping, but yeah. no, obviously it's not, but yeah i don't uh, i don't get it but it was a comedic visual gag so also every nation my arse like does <laughs> someone should count all those flags but I, I i guarantee there wasn't enough for every country in the world uh, they had the ussr on there so that accounted for like 20 modern day countries <laughs> okay fair fair uh but yeah so I mean, honestly, once they solve this problem, the movie's basically over. Obviously, there's the demise of the villain, which is kind of a separate little thing. Yeah. Uh, which... I mean, the, the, the villain steps up the entire time the bumbling idiot of a sidekick is like, I want to use the electronic earthquake machine. Which they have an electronic that. earthquake machine. Can we not gloss over that? <laughs> I see no... What's special about that? I have... It's totally normal to have an electronic earthquake machine. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you could just make an earthquake happen somewhere at the push of a button. Yeah. Well, I mean... <laughs> why does he need to be a bad guy? Why doesn't he just, like, make money off of the fact that he's got this insane technology? Because that's not the family business. Oh, uh, family yeah, business okay. is... He took, his family took out Titanic, and now they're taking out the big bus. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so he, he he tells the guy, like, okay, look... Yeah, we're down to no other options. You can go ahead and use the electronic earthquake machine. Just plug in the coordinates for it, and the earthquake will start. And he's like, all right, I'm going to give him a 6.5. He's like, no, nah, make it an 8.5. He's like, oh, okay. And, of course, it turns out that him being the bumbling idiot, he put in the coordinates for their base of operations. And 
it's the demise of both villains as far as we can tell yes so. yes they're, they're probably dead is, is the answer yep. and then the, the joke ending that right before the credits is the the bus separates in two because of all the the damage uh yep. with them blissfully unaware and well like you any other movie would end with them arriving in their destination, and this movie's like, nah, nah, they're they're they're, all, they're close, but we're yeah. just going to end it with this joke, and that's it. That's Denver it. was twenty five miles away, but we're just going to end it with the zoom out shot of the bus separating and credit. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, we've glossed over a lot of little character. Like, there's there's a lot of little character jokes and payoffs, like mm-hmm. the couple who wanted a divorce and were happy to get a divorce right towards the end when Dan's going to save uh, Kitty. They're like, hey, you're the captain. Marry us quickly. We, we made a mistake. We need to be married. Uh, the veterinarian, like, he's asked to help the married man uh, because he's injured. And mm-hmm. he's like, well, you know, I, I guess dogs and cats are kind of like people. But w- the joke being that when he goes to treat him, he actually, like, talks to him like he's a dog and gives him, like, a doggy treat and, mm-hmm. you know, says, bite down on this and, you know, so on and so on. And that's the... Yeah, guy. and then even he gets the splint onto him because it was his wrist that was injured or something like that. And when he finally did it, he's like, yeah, what do those PhDs know anyway? I'm a <laughs> doctor now. Uh, surely veterinarians, veterinarians still need to have... They're still doctors. Not a PhD. Yeah, not a PhD, though. No? Okay. That's the, that stands for a pretty human degree. <laughs> I'm fairly certain you still have to be pretty well educated to be a vet. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw. To be out fair, there. though, to be fair, he was a disgraced vet, so oh, he sh- might not have been that good to begin with. Was he like a black market vet who was doing like shady stuff in back alleys, and then they found out, and that's why he's disgraced? I mean, I'd have to assume so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. I mean, honestly, it, it does underuse some of its actors, though. Like Ned Beatty's got this role, and he's the one who goes in and does the, like, the plutonium thing at the start, but. Mm-hmm. Other than that, he, like, every time it cuts back to him, he doesn't really have a whole lot to really do, or material. Yeah, his whole subplot revolves around him and his assistant, where his assistant's just fed up with being crapped on the whole time, and, like, threatens to quit. And then when he does end up quitting, Nebiety's just distraught for, like, three scenes until he comes back in what's supposed to be a triumphant return. Where he's standing in the door, he's like, we got a bus to save. It feels like either some material got cut or it was just really underdeveloped. Like, yeah, you know, one or the other. Like, I'm not sure which, but it, it felt... It it almost felt like there probably was scenes to make the story feel more coherent and, like, mm-hmm. more fleshed out, but they trimmed it down to get 90 minutes because they were like, no, nah, just boom, boom, boom with the jokes. And I respect that as a comedy, but at the same time, like, it would be nice to ha- care a little bit about what's happening in the plot because I, I would say this is a comedy where... I don't care about anything that's happening plot wise. Oh yeah, for sure. Right? It's you know, it's just things are just happening, just be here for the jokes. And I think a great comedy, it can juggle both things where you're still invested in what's happening and you want the character to succeed and you know, do the thing they're trying to do, but it's just really funny along the way. And if anything, hmm. it can enhance the comedy because you're actually invested. So when a, a you know, a joke deflates the uh the tension intentionally or whatever, it can it can be more effective. Hmm. Uh, as opposed to, you know, I, I think that's kind of why spoofs are kind of hard to do. Well, obviously, there's, there's some good examples, but by yeah. and large, it's hard to do. And there's a reason why a lot of the ones that have been attempted in the last, like, 25 years <laughs> have been absolute garbage. Uh, I mean, in fairness, half the ones attempted in the last five years have all been the same people. That is very, very true, yes. Um, you know, I, basically, like, people are fond of Scary Movie, and... I do remember Scary Movie 3 having a few good mm. things in it, but basically it's Scary Movie 4 onwards, and that's including everything that ends with the word movie. Yeah. All, you know, all trash. Just, and I haven't seen most of it, I've just seen clips and stuff, but you you can, you know, I mean, I say that, obviously, <laughs> it's bound to be a theme on this show at some point, but, oh no, it can't be. I, I don't think no, we'd have anything to say. say. I don't think there's that's... anything we could say, to be honest. It would be the exact same. We would have a lot to say the first time and then the exact same yeah. stuff to say every other time. Yeah, it'd be too repetitious. You're right. You're right, you're right, you're right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, and- I, I personally, I think that this movie did... It's strange to me that out of all three movies we've done so far, I feel like the best one from or I should say the least impressive one from a technical aspect was actually Poseidon Adventure. 
because both Cassandra Crossing and this movie, like they went out, they shot on location, they used these big props and had these big scenes where Poseidon Adventure was very much all internal. And I think it benefited the movie, but it is strange to me that the one that feels the biggest is the one that has the least amount. I think, I think maybe that's a testament to I, either making that choice because they knew it benefited, because you just, you just admitted it benefited the movie. So if they mm -hmm. just made that choice, then that's just them being smart. And even yeah. if it was a case of, oh no, we tried doing some extra effects with like a toy boat and it just looked shit. So we didn't want to use right. it working around that limitation and knowing that you can't use that so making it feel like no this is intentional this is like claustrophobic and we're not going to show mm -hmm. too much of the outside of the boat and so on and so on uh either way you end up with a result that's them using their resources wisely and like okay this is what we can do let's make the best of it and mm -hmm. do what we can um because yeah i mean you're you're technically right like and I, but to be fair both this and um cassandra crossing don't have to do water right they're they're both you yeah, know yeah. they're on a road they're on a railroad track you know they're in locations that are easier to shoot in uh mm -hmm. but yeah i mean i think cassandra crossing was more impressive than this one from a, a filmmaking yes. perspective because you know that that had all the helicopter stuff and it actually had, was, was tense and it had all these unique kind of locations with the you know the the old shoddy bridge and you know all mm -hmm. of the path towards that uh this you know you can definitely feel when they're sitting in the train that there's a lot of uh like the rear screen like out the window of like right. you know the, it's it's very much a set movie it just so mm. but they've got a lot of real footage of this bus they made that they're driving around for the exterior shots so it does feel like it's yeah. got the the scale that it needs to and i mean uh, i will give it credit if the the uh exterior shots like shoulders passing out in the co-pilot mm -hmm. seat uh when they're leaving the lot like if you look you He's, you can see him still passed out, even in the external shots. Like, they oh, didn't sure. just film it and say, like, yeah, sure, no one's going to pay that much attention to it. Like, no, they, the, the, I think that's the, uh, line producer is in charge of those continuity things. So, mm. they earn their money. Uh, I, but yeah, I, which is, well, I was no, going to say, if I have a critique of the externals, is it would be, when the bus is in motion, I feel like that big reactor-looking thing at the, the back should maybe look like it's active some way. You, you, you sort of hear a yeah. noise as if it's rumbling or something, but I'm like, oh, a bit of light or a bit of a fume coming off of it. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get why in this time period they can't just easily do that, but it's like, yeah, that, that's the one thing that I feel like... To, get, to add to the joke, if anything, mm -hmm. is that, hey, there's like a nuclear reactor in the back of this bus. Yeah, I think the, the scene where it really needed it was uh, when they are trying to break wind uh mm. specifically they're not trying to get to some ludicrously impossible speed they're literally just trying to get to 90 miles an hour but the joke is as they're passing by all these small buildings trying to get up to 90 mm. like it's blowing out windows it's throwing people out of their chairs just from the wind drag that they're going along with them oh yeah uh, i mean but... 90s uh i mean it's fast for a bus and no bus should ever go 90 oh, miles yeah. per hour but compared to like a like say like a race car that's you know nothing mm -hmm. like you know it's, it's yeah it's yeah it's you know most regular cars can happen i mean you're not supposed to go that fast obviously like but like you can yeah no one would go that fast on normal highways <laughs> <laughs> um so you know like just a, a little bit more flash and whiz and bang to the to that side of it but that's yeah. not like a big complaint if it, mm -hmm. if anything I, I just wish i cared a little bit more about some of the characters i feel like a lot of the ensemble cast are kind yeah. of throwaway and ultimately don't really add up to much or contribute that much to the movie mm -hmm. yeah the main trio is really all i felt anything for yeah honestly um the closest it got was there is the dinner scene as we mentioned before where the fashion designer reveals that she's the daughter of the man whose foot he ate <laughs> that's right and they do a whole thing where she pulls out a gun and is like threatening to kill him for eating his. Oh, her, I forgot yeah, about this father. this whole joke. Yeah, and then like Katie's like, "No, if you want to shoot him, you have to shoot me." And then the priest is like, mm -hmm. "Yeah, if you want to shoot her, you'll have to shoot through me." And then the guy who's got like months to live goes, "Well, I'm going to die anyway, so if you want to shoot them, you're going to have to shoot through me." And he's mm -hmm. like, "But then again, I've only got a few months left to live." And he sort of swaps places with the priest, and then he swaps places with Katie, and then eventually uh, it gets back to Dan being Damn, in front. Yeah. And then 
someone else gets threatened and he's like he wasn't even in line yeah or something like it was, that yeah. it was there was a blackout or something yeah, yeah yeah momentarily and she ends up shooting the husband character but then it turns out the husband wasn't actually shot he was just faking it and then him and the wife character start making out at the table again <laughs> it's a confusing sequence but that was right before the gunshot was fired felt like the closest they were getting to the fashionista character being someone that would be cared for out of the ensemble but then it just kind of resulted in nothing yeah they just don't have en enough where i don't really feel like they had much of a payoff where they didn't really contribute anything to the actual like surviving or anything like that and mm. you know it's, it's all just dan and kitty and to an extent shoulders but mostly just those two yeah i mean every character has a setup and a payoff in terms of the guy who has six months to live he's all dour to begin with and then the fashionista once again is in a bathtub invites him in and he's like you're right i should be enjoying my time and there's the priest who doesn't believe in god and then at one point he just accidentally says oh we all need to pray or we all need to believe or something like that and he's like oh i found my faith again but it literally is just the scene setting it up and then the scene paying it off there is no yeah. build up in yeah whereas if you stories compare it to the poseidon adventure uh briefly you have all the setup and payoffs for the characters that have them all tie into like helping them survive you know ultimately right. you know the one woman gets to prove that she's useful and it kind of helps save the day for every, everyone else and you know stuff like that whereas mm. here they're all just kind of random on their own and doesn't you know, they don't affect anything they don't matter and yeah. maybe that's been a bit harsh because it's a comedy but like you know it would actually make it feel more like a constructed movie like good comedies still feel like you know you've got all the zingers and you've got all the jokes but they still feel like it comes together in, in a way in the script yeah uh, so you know um I, I would describe it as a mixed bag that is sometimes you know funny i'm using a lot of the time sometimes jokes fall a bit flat uh for me the bigger problem though is just that it feels a little bit too like the, the, the because it is just a comedy the premise is so light that you you can't really care about the actual disaster element or the the you know not that i would expect it to be as tense as one of the other movies but just I can't care about it in any way, shape, or form of like the the pacing of it or the build up mm. to it. You know, it doesn't really feel like it paces well up to a climax. It just kind of all of a sudden there's a kind of something we have to solve towards the end, and then once they solve it, it's over. You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that it does really have a standard three act structure in terms of like rising action and mm. climax and stuff like that. It is definitely just a series of jokes, and then we get to quote unquote the set piece like the big moment that is just again a vehicle for more jokes um it's a bus for I more jokes we, we can just end the review here that's it's not gonna get over <laughs> that. um but yeah no for me i think it was i just from the beginning i wasn't really worried about that i was accepting it less as a disaster movie and more as it, just the vehicle for jokes i was basically viewing it in the same sort of way that I viewed Airplane, where it's just a joke a minute sort of thing. If if they have to choose between the plot and throwing a punchline in, they're going to sacrifice the plot. And I don't mean that to sound negative, but it's just the way that they were doing this particular movie, where anything that would have been like, oh, they left this huge plot hole or something like that, it's like, no, they actively pointed at it and said, this is stupid. We are not taking this seriously. This guy is super proud to be from a line of bus drivers. And our one of our opening gags was a guy just barehanded with a nuclear rod. Like, we know that this doesn't obey any sort of logical reasoning. It's just here to be funny. So when I view it from that perspective, I don't really care that it doesn't have any sort of stakes or anything because I don't think it ever tried to. I think maybe what I'm trying to say is less stakes and more just more of a crescendo and actually yeah. like you know when I say caring about the plot I don't necessarily mean like because I'm like invested and I'm worried about the characters right. and like that I, I just mean when I look at other comedies and like because uh, you know I'm never worried when I watch I don't know what's a comedy uh, I'm not worried when I watch Ghostbusters that mm. you know, they're in jeopardy or anything like that but it still kind of builds and it still you know 
Oh yeah. You know, like there's a crescendo mm-hmm. to the plot. There's a payoff. There's a structure to it. Um, it, it, the plot and the jokes feel like they're servicing each other. Whereas here, it's like it's just all jokes. The plot is yeah. like irrelevant. It's a cartoon. Just ignore it. Basically. Yeah, no, I'll I'll easily agree that this movie. I don't know if it would have benefited from an extra five minutes. I think it ended exactly how it wanted to, but I think in terms of structure, it probably would have benefited from having them actually arrive in Denver and just having some sort of wrap up. Whereas this movie felt like, okay, we got the bus off the edge of the cliff and cut done. We're think, not doing anything else. Yeah. It could have probably used like an extra 10 minutes or so. And I, I would have given that to the ensemble cast and making them just feel like they kind of fit into the actual plot a little bit more. And yeah. I think that would actually still fit with the spoof idea that because that's what these disaster movies try to do usually. So it mm-hmm. would actually f- help with the the satirizing of the genre that it's doing. Uh, you know, it would it would add to it in the in that sense. You know, it make the comedy a little bit smarter because of that, <laughs> effectively. Yeah. That's so, fair. you know, um, but you know, I'm not gonna be too negative or too harsh on it. But like, you know, that's yeah. we're, we're, we're at ratings now. I think you know this was always going to be a bit of a shorter conversation compared to the. Uh, the others but yeah uh david what are you rating the big bus out of 10 oh, what am i rating the big bus um so obviously i did really enjoy it um it kept my attention i thought it was funny i do admit it had its problems i think that it is not a well i don't even want to say paced movie but just a well structured movie especially when it comes down to the ending um but overall, I was still just having a good time with it. I think that it is a very well done comedy, especially in a world before Airplane even existed. This was doing it on its own. And I know that it's not the first spoof movie, but it definitely ra- laid the groundwork for things that we saw. It's, it's hard in not Airplane. to think of Airplane because not only is it a spoof, but it's a spoof of a disaster genre, mm-hmm. which is what Airplane is. Yeah, but airplane is exactly. the one that everyone knows, so it's it's impossible not to think about it. Yeah, exactly. But for this particular one, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a seven. I think that okay. for different reasons, obviously, than Cassandra Crossing, it does get the same basic rating. Uh, what Cassandra Crossing had in scope and scale and feeling like it was actually doing something meaningful, this one. It kept me amused, it kept my attention, and while it didn't really have anything huge to say, it knew what it was trying to do, and I feel that it succeeded on all counts. I think it's interesting that uh, I wasn't sure how the averages were going to work out for this this theme, but it's mm-hmm. interesting that you've given, what, like a 7.5 and two sevens yep. so far? Like, you know, it's, it's higher standard than I think I was necessarily expecting uh, across the board um or I, maybe everything's just a seven i don't know we'll see when we get there <laughs> well no i mean I, i'm going a little bit low. I'm, I'm gonna go with a six out of ten i, I think it's okay. you know it's, it's got some jokes it's, it's a pleasant enough watch um but i, I couldn't read it too highly because of all the the reasons discussed um but this is a decent time if you if you if you do have access to it i i would throw it on especially if you like 70s disaster movies this would be like a nice little sort of light piss take of it to mm-hmm. to enjoy uh so a six out of ten from me um sure so uh does it make the cut uh well we'll see if we can come to an agreement uh of course i'm favoring it so i think it should make the cut i could go down to cutting it close but i'd have some arguments if you think it shouldn't even make it at all no no i wouldn't put it that low uh for for my mind it is between cutting it close and making the cut i think mm. i think i am leaning towards cutting it close okay be- because you know I, I don't know if it has lasting appeal necessarily but i think if you're making a collection of disaster films this one definitely doesn't need to be included i don't think that it really holds up among other disaster films but i do think it is just a decent quality movie that is worth checking out yeah yeah. Uh, well, what are we agreeing on then? I'll say cutting it close if that sounds good to you. Yes. I agree, agree with me. Uh, that's the correct answer, yes. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> sounds yes. good. I like how, what you're saying. Let's do that. 
so there you go that's uh movie number three of five of the season one of 70 disaster movies uh season two coming sometime next well not next year 2024 is what i mean to say <laughs> Mm. My, my mains already in 2020 because we've, map, we've mapped out most of 2023 already so my mains yeah. already in there uh but coming up we're next at- time we're looking at city on fire as the next 70s disaster movie so this is 1979 uh, and i'll specify that because there is an 80s action movie called city on fire just so that no one's confused by it uh gotcha. 1979 is the one in question Yep. So. we are not doing 80s movies on this 70s disaster season that is a, yes yes exactly uh, and I'm just noticing a name in the credits for the next one. Leslie Nielsen makes a return. Does he now? Yes, he's the mayor Fantastic. in the next movie. So uh, that's exciting. We'll see. Right. We'll see what that's all about. Other than the fact that obviously stuff's on fire. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, oh, also uh, Shelley Winters, who I don't know who she was, but she was in Poseidon Adventure as well. Oh, really? Yep. She's listed here under Poseidon Adventure. Oh, yeah. um, we're just getting the whole crew back together apparently yeah uh and ava gardner's in this who was in cassandra crossing it's like everyone in the 70s lived at the same time that's crazy <laughs> uh henry fonda's in it as well which is you know he's a big name right. of course the lead is barry newman who i'm not as familiar with uh yeah me neither but hey we'll find out next week uh yep. that is uh our thoughts on uh the big bus so if you have seen the big bus and i suspect most of you won't have because it's not exactly mm-hmm. something i'd heard of before uh let me know or let us know in the comments what you think about it and you can like subscribe ding the bell for notifications all that stuff it helps us out a lot if you do uh and of course you can support all the content by becoming a member on youtube or go over to patreon.com slash tv and supporting all the content and getting some bonuses for your trouble. Uh, we did Beyond the Poseidon Adventure as the bonus episode for this month, this season. So you can go and check out that. And of course, if you uh, want to do a one-time thing, you can also just use this, the, uh, the Super Thanks button on YouTube if you like. But uh, any and all help is appreciated. In fact, I will take this time to thank our Patreon producers uh, right now. Thank you very much. To Tyler Hess and the Palacios, Board now, Christopher Moy, David Brown, Al Treisman, and Alison M. Fordyce. Uh, they are some of our higher tiered patrons. But obviously, thanks to all of our patrons and all of our viewers and listeners. It is greatly appreciated. And of course, you can uh, rate the audio podcast on iTunes or wherever you podcast from, five stars. That also helps out. And share us amongst your friends. Uh, threaten them with good podcast material. Uh, tell them that we did something crazy. Like, tell them that we just launched into a conspiracy tirade or something. And I'll listen through the whole thing waiting for it. <laughs> and then hopefully go, oh, that was informative and entertaining. Maybe I will yeah. come back anyway. Uh, I don't even mind that I was tricked into listening to this. Oh, we didn't trick them. The, the friend tricked yeah. them. Friend, perfect. Except that now they have confirmation that I have asked them to trick them. So. Okay, well, you tricked them. I didn't trick them. <laughs> no, yeah, you're innocent. That's fine. I'll take the fall. I'm innocent in all this. Uh, <laughs> but that is the show. That is the Collector's Cut. Thank you very much for joining us. We always appreciate it. Keep watching movies. And damn it, woman, we're talking about buses. Bye.